forward with the first talk. Back to the schedule, our first speaker of the day is Ramon Huidobro. I hope I presented his name correctly. Ramon is from Chile, but he lives in Vienna since uh, 19 years now. And uh, apparently he loves wearing onesies. This is the first time I hear something like that. <laughs> but that is pretty cool. It's uh, totally a thing. And um, also Nintendo trivia. So if you want to exchange anything like that, go to him. He's super nice. So go and talk to him after the talk because we won't have time for uh, questions. And uh, the talk of today is hardware hacking with your Rails app. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for that lovely introduction. And uh, good morning to everyone. Guten Morgen. Sorry for my Wienerisch. Um, how are we all doing today? How about this conference, huh? Ooh. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah, so thanks for coming. Thanks for listening to me. I won't bore you, I promise. So a little bit about me, if this thing turns on. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, yeah, I'm Ramon. Um, I am a freelance software developer living in Vienna, in Austria, and uh, I also teach children to code. I do one to keep the other alive. You can guess which is which. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you might have seen my photo on the website, and you're wondering, what's up? Where's, why, where's the picture with the dog? Don't worry, I've got you covered. This is Fiona. She's the love of my life. She's got these eyes that say a million things in a way I've never seen on a human or creature before. And uh, they, they, she's so expressive. She judges my wife for eating uh, mango. And um, in, in, in Chilean Spanish, or I think it's exclusive to Chilean Spanish, we have this word regalona. She's my regalona. And I tried to look it up for, in English, and unfortunately Google Translate didn't help me out. Which is fine. Okay, I thought, okay, well, German has more, many words. Let's try it in German. Now, this is interesting. It capitalized it. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I, I, I love working in Ruby. I, I, it's such a fun programming language. Rails is a great framework for me to get the things done I need to do. And, you know, as a freelancer, one thing I love is that I can work in so many different paradigms. One minute I'm working on, you know, government projects for helping, uh, helping people find um, um, emergency contacts. Uh, the other minute I'm in the, I'm in behind a cafeteria at an office, at an office building to helping people get their food for lunch. And that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about today. So one of my clients, Takeaway.io, this is a, a, a culinary catering restaurant business just north of Vienna in the industrial zone that specializes in three parts. Catering, uh, cafeteria lunch for workers, and the restaurant. And most of my work goes in the middle part, the cafeteria, the cafeteria lunch. And uh, so what, what my work entails is providing a service where users can go online, look up what they would like to eat, uh, order their fit menus for the week for lunch, and then on the day we prepare it and serve it to them. Now, as that company has grown, they've taken on new companies, new clients uh, to, to serve lunch to them. And every time that happens, they come in and we talk to them and they say, yeah, this is great, but I need this or that. Can you add a checkbox here? Can you add a, you know, can you overload your database with more Boolean flags there? And, and so this one company, a paper manufacturing company, they came up to us and said, so our workers, uh, they work on the factory floor and they don't really have access to a computer at their desk because they're you know, standing working all day. So this part isn't gonna really work for us. We need a new solution. So each employee has their own chip card and we would like to have a system where they scan their chip card and then look at a, at a terminal that we set up in the cafeteria and, and order their food for the week. And so, okay, we sat down, my client and I, and we started, you know, drafting up what we could do. And I like to give my projects fun names, so I called this one Project Hairnet. And so, the way it works, 
you scan your chip card, you get a screen with the menu, you place your orders, and then on the day you get your food and enjoy it accordingly. And immediately, my mind is racing. I'm like, okay, we're gonna have this super fancy React app with Rails REST API in the background, or some sort of native app with dedicated hardware that will manufacture in China or something like this. <laughs> and uh, my client, who happens to be a, a master, have, happens to have a master's degree in computer science, he said, hold on, hold on, hold on, slow down. We have a perfectly good Rails app running in the background. Why don't we just set up a very simple touchscreen with a web page to do this? Great. So we started looking at our requirements, first of which was our hardware. Obviously, we have our, uh, our chip card reader. This is a TWN something something that reads uh, legit cards. They, they have some embedded data on them. And as for a PC, like I said before, we could have some sort of special monitor touch screen connected to the cloud somehow. But really, what it ended up being was an all-in-one PC with a touch screen on it, which actually worked out great. In terms of software, all we needed was Ubuntu and Chromium, you know, so a browser. So that took care of hardware. Great, first step done. Next up is security, because obviously, if you leave a computer standing in the middle of a cafeteria where you won't be there a lot of the time, anybody could come in, plug in a keyboard, and mess around with it, especially if they're malicious and know what they're doing. So we needed to have a way in order to protect that Chromium instance from being, iso from being tampered with. So, okay, I found out that I can start up Chromium with full screen, which worked out pretty well. You would boot up, you would open up Chromium and you'd have the website there. Problem is, I forgot to take into consideration that resolving host, what does that mean? Sorry. Whoops. Oh, open up a new tab, of course. Okay. So anybody could come in with a keyboard, press Alt and Tab, and then just mess everything up. So I found out that Ubuntu, as, men as, well, as, as well as other operating systems, offers a way for you to set up what's called a kiosk mode. And what this does is open up a, an app specifically windowed out so that you wouldn't have access to you know, the start menu or you know, any, of, any of the desktop or open up a terminal or anything like that, which was great. So then after setting this up, you can check it out how, to, how I did it here. Uh, when I would turn on the computer, I would get a nice blank Ubuntu screen, which, believe it or not, is what I wanted. So then I started, I went to my, to my notebook and I started sketching out how I could do this, right? So on the phone or on the, ta uh, or on the laptop, you could just go to the website and log in, but we'd need to have it on the touchscreen terminal so that when you'd go to the website, you'd just scan your chip card to get started. And we thought about how to do this, there, we, and the best way we came up with was by using uh, a b simple before action with Rails and a request header. Now, you might think this isn't the fanciest way to do that, but it worked. So all we did was, if the browser, the Chromium instance on our terminal would submit a request environment, uh, request HTTP header with a secret token to authorize the terminal to access the the chip card scanning mode, then I was good to go. And if I ever needed to use it, such as here, I was able to create a helper that would check that we the secret. I didn't actually do it by <laughs> embedding the, the, the secret token into the code, but this is for the sake of example. Um, and, and, and with this, we could check whether we were in kiosk mode and show that page accordingly. Now, I didn't have a lot of experience with messing around with HTTP headers at the time, and I found out that getting that header over to the app is actually not as straightforward as I thought. Getting the, the browser to pass on that header was something I needed to figure out. So after doing some research for development purposes, I did find a Chromium uh, um, extension that allows you to set up a request header with that secret token, which actually worked out pretty well but it seemed kind of hacky for you know, a, a production environment. Bearing in mind, I had three weeks to do this, by the way. So what I found out I could do instead was set up an Electron app. For those that don't know, Electron lets you build, uh, let you build native apps onto your, onto, your, uh, onto your operating system that run in a Chromium instance, and that turned out to be exactly what I needed. So with that, I could just 
load up the URL, and pass it the token I needed. And that worked out fantastically. So now you would open up the, you would turn on the, the computer, and we had it set up to automatically run this Electron app. And then with that, the terminal would go automatically, sorry about my handwriting, um, to, to scan my chip card. So what did I learn from this? So impeding tampering with dedicated hardware like this is critical for this kind of application. No matter if, if it's for a big company or a small company, you need to be able to, you, you need to think about the things that can come up. So that's security handled. Now let's look at the actual chip card scanning. So what we came up with was a simple Rails page that says, in German it says, welcome, please scan your chip card. And that worked out pretty well. The idea was that you take your Legic card, scan it over the card reader, it would do a little beep, and then you would be able to access the menu for the week. Now, what I learned is that each of these Legic cards has an embedded number in them, a, a user ID provided by the company. So my idea was, OK, back to my drawing board, I would scan the chip card, and it would automatically open the menu. Now, these, uh, these uh, chip card readers need to be configured in, or in order to read that data. At, if by default out of the factory, what they will do is um, uh, show, uh, uh, show a um, UUID, a U uh, an identifier of that card, which is not quite what we wanted because each user has this number associated with them. So I looked up the documentation, I looked up the website of this manufacturer, and it turns out the only way to program these things is with a Windows Vista app. <laughs> it's called App Blaster, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. <laughs> now, what this app does is it, fr uh, it uh, flashes a firmware onto the, the chip card reader itself. Now, it did come with some code samples, and I thought, OK, I'm a programmer. I know how to do this. Uh, even if it is, don't, don't worry about the code itself. Don't worry about, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's, it's like a subset of C or something. I can do this. The documentation is there. It's a bit outdated, and half of it is in German, but I can handle it. <laughs> it turns out that I got nowhere. I, couldn't, I kept getting read errors and just completely, you know, some sort of out of memory access or some sort of stack overflow or something. This exhausted me. And I spent maybe a week on this, trying to get this firmware to work. And I don't know why I didn't think of it before. I gave a call to the manufacturer. I said, you know, hey, I've got this number. Can you help me? And they said, sure, no problem. And after having a bit of a back and forth with them, I found out that not only is the number itself on the card encrypted, which is fair enough, security and all that. But the memory address where that number is located is also encrypted. So when I asked them, how can I, can you give me the address? They told me, oh no, I'm sorry, you need to sign a non-disclosure agreement and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, you do it, please. And they gave me a firmware. I loaded up my app blaster. <laughs> sorry, I just love the name of this app. And believe it or not, it worked. And what was clever is that this uh, chip card reader would act as a USB keyboard. And then I thought, well, that's cool. I can use it to ent just enter the data into the web app itself. I don't need to have some sort of special uh, Linux program reading from some sort of file or s from file descriptor or something. What was even more interesting is that this firmware was configured by default to not only enter the four numbers, but also a carriage return which is cool. I thought, huh, so really all I need on our chip card scanning page is an input field where you just put in your chip card, you know, you put it in and you scan your chip card and you're good to go. A couple problems came up. If you turn on the computer, it loads the web page up automatically, you start scanning, beep, 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 nothing's happening. And I'm thinking, I must be doing something wrong. Well, it turns out the, text, the input field isn't focused. So how do I do that? Turns out Rails is nice and offers an autofocus. <laughs> Good so far. Now, what happens if uh, the computer goes to sleep, right? And I turn it back on, the focus is gone. 
Turns out JavaScript has a, a solution for that as well, <laughs> which is great. And then I showed it to my client, and he said, yeah, but it looks kind of hacky to have just an input field there. Couldn't we make it like some sort of JavaScript waiting to receive some input? And I thought, sure, but we could also just make it invisible. <laughs> <laughs> and that worked. Uh, so you, a customer would come in, they'd scan their chip card, beep, and they'd be logged into our menu. Fantastic. So what I learned from this is you know, not to spend too much time on a, on a problem where you're just like, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's totally fine to ask for help. In fact, it's a good thing to do. And yes, it was a little hacky, but it works. And if I find a better solution later on or find a, so find a problem, there's no worries to, to look into that. So that's another requirement done. Next up is stability. It's important that uh, you know, this terminal is running smoothly and doesn't come up with any hiccups because, as we all know, there could be a lightning storm, there could be some sort of power outage, or, God forbid, someone comes around and starts messing with our cables. Turns out, I found out, that any, uh, most computers in their BIOS, you know, that little, that blue screen DOS looking thing that you load up and sometimes mess around with when you turn on your computer, um, it offers a way for you to be able to to automatically turn on after a power loss, which was really interesting. And we tested it out. We'd unplug it and plug it back in. It was kind of scary, but it worked. Now you're probably wondering, there's not the only type of problem that can come up. What if something really happens and I need to get in there and fix it? So I thought, OK, what I would like to have is a way for me from my house. Yes, that's a house, and that's my laptop. <laughs> how I can connect to business. And that's the terminal. I need a way for me to be able to access the terminal so that I can, you know, maybe do a reboot if needed or, you know, up upgrade some electron stuff or anything like that. And I thought, okay, I could SSH into it, but my client very, very uh, wisely told me uh, we really shouldn't, wouldn't want to leave an SSH port open for the public. So that's not a solution. We thought of VNC, which is uh, like an open screen sharing kind of technology, which lets me remotely look at what the screen is showing, which would look a little weird for the users if they're in the middle of ordering lunch and suddenly I come in and I'm like, oh, let me just open a terminal real quick. <laughs> They'd think the computer's possessed. Third option is for me to go all the way to the north of Vienna, which is like an hour and a half, and go and fix it manually. So th uh, that was definitely not an option. <laughs> and then my client, who again is a computer science master, which I'm not, he said to me something I'll never forget, and I'll put it in a nice quote. Why not try reverse SSH tunneling to do the job? Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like some weird wizard powers. <laughs> My wife did not let me come on stage today without having this photo in the presentation. <laughs> um, now, you're probably wondering, for those that don't know, what on earth is reverse SSH tunneling, and why does it sound so cool? It sounds magical, but really, it's not all that weird. So what you do is, on startup, the terminal will connect to our server, the takeaway server, via uh, via, sorry, via this port here, and what will happen is the, com the terminal will be constantly connected to our takeaway server and have this port open so that if I were to connect to the takeaway server on that port, then it would redirect any SSH traffic over to the open port on the terminal. So all I have to do is just connect to the terminal user at the takeaway server on that port. So what happens is I, can, I SSH into the, into the takeaway server, but then I'm redirected to the terminal itself. And it's as if I've connected directly into the terminal itself. I could do all the maintenance I needed. I could freak out all the cats I wanted to. So from this, I learned that there's many options available to you that you might think, oh, this is too high tech for me. They're readily available for you to use. Also, reverse SSH tunnels are awesome and sound awesome. So 
that's the last requirement done. And with that, I was able to check off Project Hairnet, and we were done for the day. But you're probably wondering, then what happened? Well, when you work with clients and they work with other clients, you kind of become a, some sort of weird middleman, and they start saying, hey, can we add this part here? And can we add this part there? And can we have a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that? And I thought, okay, we, of course, consolidated it in a way that this could be done in a way that doesn't you know, turn our Rails app into a monolith. So I started a can we have list. The first one was automatic logout, which makes sense. What would happen is that some users would come, scan their chip card, beep, and then they would you know, look at the menu, pick what they want, and then walk away, leaving their menu freely available for someone else to just come in and say, oh, the menu's open, cool, and order more food for that person. <laughs> now, I started looking into solutions how we could do this, and it turns out jQuery, uh, offers, well, not jQuery itself, but there's a plugin available for jQuery to, when you don't touch the computer for a while, it redirects to another URL. It even shows a little notice. I'll show you that shortly. So it took a pretty short line of JavaScript in order for me to set up how long I should wait for until the notice appears, how long the notice should show, and uh, which notice, what text will appear on the notice, as well as the logout URL. And that works great. So what you'd be treated with, again, it's in German. Uh, at the top in red, you can see, due to inactivity, you will be logged out in eight seconds automatically for security reasons. Tap here to stay logged in, which worked out great. That's one can we have done. The next one is a bit trickier. So what would happen is that some users would come in to the cafeteria to get their food, and, and we had the, the cafeteria workers had a list of names and dishes. And they say, oh, yeah, I did order that, but I really want the schnitzel, please. And so the, the cafeteria would you know, end up with a bit of a mess. A lot of orders wouldn't get picked up. Some orders, which were meant to be picked up, didn't get, uh, were not available anymore for the user. So instead, so what we needed was a way for this user, when they come to the cafeteria, Again, scan their chip card, beep, and then it would show both the cafeteria worker and the, wor and the user what they had ordered and, at the same time, confirm that they've picked it up because it could be that someone would come and be like, beep, oh yeah, I had a schnitzel, nice. And then they feel like seconds they come back, they're like, beep, oh great, more schnitzel for me, which is not what we want. And I started thinking about this, and a lot of the technology I had built for the order terminal could be reused here. So... Believe it or not, what we, what we just did was buy a Raspberry Pi kit. This cost less than 150 euros. And just set it up the same way, Electron app, Chromium, automatic SSH for me to maintain. And then I just did a little bit of Rails stuff, and I ended up with a way for somebody to come, beep, and it would say there in green, uh, your order has been successfully picked up. And if you beep, scan again, then it would say, this order has already been picked up. And that way we could keep tabs on who was ordering what, and my client could build the company accordingly. Uh, what ended up happening then was when users forgot to order, and they'd be like, oh, come on, I'm really hungry. They'd, um, <laughs> what we started doing was sending out reserves. What, we've, what these were, were extra dishes just in case a user hadn't ordered, or if they thought they were going to be sick on that day, something like this. And so what we were able to do is for the user to scan their chip card, beep, and then it would show them a menu. This is all in German, but it's, you know, your, your rudimentary office lunch stuff. <laughs> uh, and it would show them how much is available and which is sold out. And so you might be wondering, how does this work in action? Well, I did just so happen to make a video to send to my client, and now I'm going to show it to you. I hope it works. That looks good. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you. I know that's not as exciting as it looks, but I was, you couldn't tell, but I was jumping behind the screen, <laughs> behind the camera. So, right. So that completed all of our can we haves for now. And this is just the beginning of these small things we can do with hardware, dedica dedicated, yes, but simple hardware that we can extend using our Rails app. And from this, we started thinking about maybe this is the beginning of some sort of cache register system. Maybe we can have some sort of dual screen where, one, where the cafeteria manager looks at what's been ordered and the user can see what they've ordered or would like to order. The possibilities are endless. So let's look at our takeaways. <laughs> Get it? Because the company's called takeaway? Come on, humor me, please. <laughs> Um, reinventing the wheel is something that I've been told often that it's not something I want to do. But I find that in small ways, that can be done. Cost-effective solutions are also pretty important because that's how most ideas are born. And finally, what I would love to give to you as a takeaway is play around with your existing tech. There's a lot that you can do with it. So. I'm going to take a short minute as my talk wraps up now to talk a little bit about having given you this presentation. And those of you, I've been talking to some of you yesterday, asking you, so when are you giving a talk? And they say, oh, I don't know what to talk about. So here's a question. Are you free next Saturday? You see, there's this initiative called the Global Diversity CFP Day that helps people who are not experienced in public speaking or would love to give presentations and has workshops all around the world. There's four in Germany, none of which are in Munich, I'm sorry. Um, and there's gonna be one in Vienna, and it's to help people get comfortable with submitting proposals, coming up with ideas. Let me tell you, um, even if your talk topic sounds like something, uh, you know, uh, everybody's heard this one before, but not your take on it, and that's something important to remember. So please consider either coaching or attending one of these co co uh, one of these workshops. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Here I am. And this is our <gasps> gift for you. I love snow globes. It's cool. Thank you. You're Can I have a hug? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this.